I'm Dr. Sarah Parks, and I am making this video from Dublin City University in Dublin, Ireland. And my, HP, my PhD from McGill University, Canada is in early Judaism and early Christianity and New Testament. And so I thought I'd share uh, some information about what historians actually think about Mary Magdalene, since there are so many different ideas about her swirling around. Where did they come from? And which ones go back to what we might call the historical Mary Magdalene? So first, just think for a minute, what comes to mind when you hear the words Mary Magdalene? Typically what people might say to me are, Jesus lover, Jesus wife, a prostitute, a repentant prostitute, um, different things like this. Let's have a look down through popular uh, imagination about Mary Magdalene and see some of these images of her. Here she is from the 1500s. She's nude and she has her hair grown all the way down past her waist. She looks pretty young. Here she is again, also long hair, uh, clothes kind of half falling off, quite young. And this painting by Titian is called Penitent. Magdalene. And we'll see that that is quite a trope, the penitent Magdalene. So obviously people have the idea that she's done something wrong and so much so that she's famous for it. And many, many paintings and sculptures are called the penitent Magdalene. Here her eyes are red. She's been crying so much for whatever it is she's done wrong here. You'll notice down beside her is a little jar. It's another thing that keeps popping up regarding Mary Magdalene. Here she is again, Penitent Magdalene by Donatello. Uh, hair, just using hair as clothing, looking haggard um, for whatever it is she's sorry for. Here she is again in Penitence. This time she's wearing clothes uh, in El Greco's version of her and she looks quite um, stylish and proper, but she is sad and sorry and looking up for forgiveness. She's got her little jar beside her and a skull. She's often depicted with a skull as a memento mori, a reminder of death, uh, an aid for meditation and prayer and penitence, a uh, reminder of mortality. Once again, here she is penitent by Tintoretto. Tintoretto, she's got uh, like a hair, a scratchy hair shirt to sort of doubly be sorry for her sins. Um, she's got a skull to contemplate. Once again, a little jar. Here she is penitent again by golly, wearing clothes this time, but, but really thinking wistfully about uh, what she's sorry for. And she's got a skull again. Penitent again in the 1800s, uh, just hands turned upward in supplication. Here's Rubens' uh, study for a Mary Magdalene. It's not called anything, but she does look um, bowed down, bothered by something. Once again, naked, not wearing any clothes. Um, here she is refreshingly unpenitent, looking quite dapper, but still carrying her little jar. Another dapper Mary Magdalene in, from the 1500s, prominently featuring her jar. Here's a different trope we often see of her. Perhaps this explains the jar. Mary Magdalene washing Jesus' feet is another very common title you'll see on paintings and sculptures of her. So here she is washing Jesus' feet. There's one from the 1600s. Another one, the Magdalene washing the feet of Jesus, 1600s. And my favorite, Mary Magdalene in a grotto. What's she doing there? Why doesn't she at least have a little cushion? Um, I don't know. 
Moving to some more modern or contemporary rereadings of Mary Magdalene, we've probably all heard of the Da Vinci Code um, novel that I won't spoil it, but it does participate in the longstanding idea that she was a lover of Jesus. And another very recent um, interpretation of Mary Magdalene is the film um, directed by Garth Davis, who says about his decision about the way he depicted Mary Magdalene, when I reread the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Mark, so he's reading some New Testament Gospels and some Gospels that didn't make it into the canon, and started getting into the research, I realized that she was actually a really significant spiritual figure and obviously a very courageous woman to have left her family to follow her spiritual calling, just a remarkable human being. But when people think of Mary, they think of her as a lover. They're always sexualizing her. Notice that all those paintings or many of the paintings were nudes or in states of uh, half dress. Um, they were all young, sort of of a sexually vibrant age, stereotypically. Um, so that rings true. Uh, they're always sexualizing her. I don't know where all those inventions come from, and I don't know why women are always put into those contexts. Well, I mean, that's the patriarchy, but maybe he didn't realize that. But when you really go back and look at the Gospels and look at the history, she was present in all the major elements of Jesus' story and had a very close relationship with him. We're just acknowledging that. So that's some comments from the director of the Mary, more recent Mary Magdalene film, where he said he actually went to look through ancient texts to see what could be learned about her from the earliest sources which is a good practice. And he found her to be quite important and more as a spiritual person than as a sexual person. All of those interpretations of Mary Magdalene have been from what we might call Western Christendom or the Western world. What if we look at what's known as Eastern Christianity uh, from a very early split in the Christian church, uh, Roman Christianity, was Western. And then if we look at Mary Magdalene in Eastern uh, remembrance, hmm, quite a bit different. Here she has a halo, is clearly a saint. In fact, this is an icon, an item of devotion. And it's, uh, it's called Saint Mary Magdalene, Hagia Maria Magdalena in the Greek. She's got her jar, but she also has an egg. What's that about? Uh, another Orthodox icon of Saint Mary Magdalene, the myrrh bearer. And then a third example of an icon, this is a more modern one, no jar. Darker skin, maybe trying to be more accurate, and uh, still with the egg. Saint Mary Magdalene, this one's called. So, Looking at all these me memories of her down through thousands of years, what is she so penitent about in so many paintings and sculptures? Why is she associated with a jar of ointment or an egg? Why are some of the images of her saintly icons and others are nude or with clothes hanging off? Did Mary Magdalene wash Jesus' feet? Was she the only woman close to Jesus? Was she Jesus' wife or lover? What does her name mean? Let's go to the earliest historical evidence for her to see how she was originally remembered and thought of by those who first wrote about her. And that would be six passages in the canonical gospels. These are probably the earliest things that have come down to us about her. So first century or early second century at the latest. Uh, so she's in all four gospels in these six places and some of them are quite lengthy passages. So the, the first gospel that was written, the oldest gospel, the earliest gospel is Mark. And Mary Magdalene appears 
in the execution scene. Jesus has just died. And here's what it says. There were women looking on from a distance. So with Jesus at the time of his death, his women followers were there, according to Mark. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome. So we've got three named women uh, and maybe others. These used to follow him. So they were disciples uh, close enough to him that they traveled as he went around the Galilee and provided for him when he was in Galilee. So financial backers of the early Jesus movement, financial supporters of Jesus. And there were many other women, women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. So we often picture 12 male disciples and Jesus, and those are the besties, and it's always just them. Um, but this picture that Mark gives us at the end of his gospel, even though he hasn't mentioned these women all the time, as Helen Bond says, we've got to go back and read Mark from the beginning as though Jesus were followed closely by a bigger number of disciples. Many of them were women, and the money was coming from women. So they were maybe older, uh, of independent means, maybe some elite women or business women. Um, that's all part of the early Jesus movement and Jesus career. That's where the money was coming from. So then Jesus has died. Joseph, skip a few, skip a bit. Joseph wrapped the body in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where it was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome bought spices. So we've got Mary following the body to where it's laid. And we've got Mary again, uh, waiting for the Sabbath to be over because this is a Jewish movement and these people are Jewish and they're Torah observant. So they don't do anything during the Sabbath. Then after the Sabbath is over, Mary brings to, uh, two other women again, and they go to an anoint the body with spices to embalm the body and prepare it. So they get to the tomb thinking, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Because it's quite heavy. When they looked up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, a young man, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you'll see him. So this assumes um, that Mary is close to the, the 12, that she knows where they are right now, that they're going to listen to her, and that they're all going to go back together to Galilee. So once again, we see Mary depicted as a real insider. Uh, but they, they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And this is where the first Mark's gospel probably ended. And there's some funny business going on with the endings. There's different endings with different manuscripts. People weren't happy with that ending. It was too abrupt, too fearful too sad and they've added a shorter and a longer ending down through the uh, century that centuries that followed so this was this part was added later he appeared jesus appeared first to mary magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons she went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping there's a lot to unpack here in our very earliest source for Mary Magdalene. Remember, a historical source doesn't mean everything happened exactly as the source says, but it does mean that someone at an early stage felt that this remembering of her would be accepted. So pl somewhat plausible to its audience. Um, whatever you want to believe about resurrection uh, literally happening, 
that's that's not something we can derive from this source. But what we do know from this source is that nobody would know that Jesus, if Jesus had resurrected, if these women hadn't gone to the tomb. In other words, um, if there were any other way for Mark to tell of Jesus' resurrection, other than it being a woman, he would have. Because in antiquity, women were generally not seen as reliable uh, sources for testimony. Um, it wasn't necessarily a time when people would be like, yes, believe her. Uh, so the fact that Mary is the only, and these other two women in Mark, are the only witnesses to this extremely pivotal event for early Christianity says that Mark believed these were the first witnesses. This is, this is what Mark had heard. This is how people had learned of Jesus' resurrection. It was only because of these women. Um, note, it mentions that he had cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. Now, we saw a lot of paintings of her being penitent. But what are demons in the, the first century, the early Roman era? Demons are the science of the day. They do not mean like they do today, necessarily anything um, evil or what we would call demonic. They're spirits of varying kinds. The spirits could be a toothache, a headache, a mental illness. Um, yes, people in antiquity believed in moral failures, but demons were not a moral failure. Um, unless they would use a specific word such as like an, a spirit of evil. So if this text says he had cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene, we should not assume anything was evil about her or sinful. We can assume that she, because of the number seven, she was really sick. So probably the way this rich woman met Jesus in the first place, traveling around rural Galilee, was that she had heard he was an efficient healer. Um, lots of people followed him for healing. So they must, he must have had a positive reputation as someone who could heal for a rich person to go and seek healing. And probably it was a successful healing. She experienced healing from whatever this intense illness was. Um, so nothing to be penitent for yet. <coughs> Let's move to Matthew, probably the second gospel written a couple of decades later. Um, once again, Mary Magdalene gets brought in in Matthew's execution scene. It's quite similar. Many women were there looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. That checks out with Mark. Um, among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So again, three uh, specific women are named and then many others are mentioned and the women are identified as patrons of the movement. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. Nice added touch, he, he actually had built the tomb. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. After the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. So once again, they're, they're Sabbath observant, they're Torah observant. So they're, it's still a Jewish movement at this point. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb and there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord, no more young man, descending from heaven came back and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. Some added touches here by Matthew. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. Oh, in this one, there are guards. But the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here for he's been raised. Go quickly and tell his disciples he's been raised from the dead. He's going ahead of you to Galilee there you will see him. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, greetings. 
And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. So pretty similar to Mark, written a decade or more later, um, some added flourishes, but the core is still no men see this resurrection situation. We've got to rely on women. The women kind of shift across the gospels, but Mary Magdalene is always one of them. And according to this tradition, the, the first person to whom the resurrected Jesus makes an appearance. So once again, we owe the, we owe the story of the resurrection to Mary Magdalene and other women. Luke um, is the only one to mention Mary a bit earlier on in the story instead of bringing her in at the end, like, ta-da, she was the patron all along. Uh, here he says the 12 were with him, with Jesus as he's going through cities and villages. So they're traveling together, part of the inner core that moves around together. The 12 were with him as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. So Luke brings in evil spirits. Uh, Luke who's writing later again, maybe around the turn of the century. So many decades later, Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out. He's got that tradition. And Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Susanna, and many others. So we've got more named women, um, probably elite women. So Mary Magdalene's probably a more elite woman. Nowhere do we see any indication that she would be particularly young. In fact, we see a lot of hints that she might have been quite old um, to have been able to amass independent wealth. She provided for them out of her own resources along with these other elite women. And Luke has her coming back in again at the end of Luke's gospel, Jesus has been buried. And Luke says the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee, so all the way to Jerusalem, a long journey on foot, they were in it together. They saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. So still acknowledging these are Jewish women. But on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb, taking the spices. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The, the, these shift. It's one young man, it's two angels, it's two men in dazzling clothes, um, but certain things remain the same. The women were terrified and bowed to the ground, but the men said to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. Oh, yeah, that was a strange thing to say. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the 11 and to all the rest. Now, it was, Mary, Luke names them at the end, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. Nobody can get this right. This list changes in every single gospel, but one element remains the same. Nobody takes Mary Magdalene out of the list. That's because probably for these writers, this was a tradition that was already known long before them. And so they had to keep it in because people knew it and they expected it. So whatever the reality was of what happened around Jesus' death and his body and his tomb, um, Back to the very earliest records we have, people think Mary Magdalene saw it. She is our main witness for this pivotal uh, event in, in early Christianity. Um, and finally, the Gospel of John, another late gospel around the turn of the century. Here, Jesus is being executed. John says, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
So John's got her there as well. And after Jesus' burial, John also mentions her. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Here she's alone. She saw that the stone had been removed, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So finally here, we see one gospel writer saying, it's not okay that uh, we only have women as witnesses here. I'm going to bring in some men. Enough time has passed. People are forgetful. It's been decades and decades and decades. We need some men to witness the empty tomb. As a historian, I do not believe. I believe this is an invention because of the extreme discomfort around letting something so important rest with women. So here we have a little scuffle. Um, I've shortened it, but there's a scuffle between Peter and the other disciple and they try to get there first. Um, one gets there first, but the other one goes in the tomb first. But anyway, the disciples, the, the men now see, okay, the tomb is empty and then they go home. But Mary stays there crying outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. She has no idea this is him for some reason. The, maybe the author um, assumes that people don't look the same after the, the resurrection because it was expected among uh, some Jews that the resurrection would happen and everyone dead would rise, but maybe that they wouldn't be in the same form. Maybe that's what's going on here. Anyway, Jesus said to her, Mary, when he says her name in this text, she recognizes him, recognizes him. She turned and said to him in Hebrew or Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. She doesn't say, you know, cupcake, my love, my poopsie. She says, my teacher, uh, which once again is not a sexualized relationship. It's an intellectual and religious and spiritual relationship. Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me because I've not yet ascended to the father. Would you randomly while strolling around say, oh, and by the way, in case you were thinking about it, do not hold on to me. No, you'd say that because the person was already holding on to you, which shows us an idea that they were very close, but not as lovers, as uh, teacher and student and members of an important spiritual movement together. So Mary Magdalene goes and announces to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and she tells them. So in every canonical gospel tradition, there is no knowledge that Jesus has risen from the dead, if not through Mary Magdalene. So being a historian is like being a detective. You sift through the evidence. You weigh whether it has any biases. We know the Gospels do have biases, uh, uh, aims, goals, audiences in mind. So with all of that in our minds, what can we put together from the six earliest mentions of Mary Magdalene that we've just gone through? We know that she was part of the group that traveled with Jesus. We know that she was close to his family and one of the inner core. We know that she was independently wealthy. She's not named as though she's like of a man. Her last name isn't related to a man. She's independent, uh, perhaps a widow. She's a patron of the movement, one of the major providers of financial backing. She is connected with having been healed from seven demons. So she probably met Jesus through a successful healing experience. 
not necessarily or not probably anything that she needed to be repentant, repentant of, but something that was an ailment. She was Jewish. Uh, she was the first and sometimes the only remembered a resurrection witness. Uh, she was tasked with the message of spreading, with the, the task of spreading that message. There were a lot of other women as well. She's not the only important woman in the early Jesus movement. There were many and they were um, significant. Um, and she's possibly a lot older than Jesus. How, how did she have that much money? Uh, maybe a widow, maybe a life, lifetime of business. Um, no indication that she's young or naked at any time. <laughs> except in the bath. Um, so moving forward a little bit, there is additional ancient evidence about her. It's a little bit later. And it's from things like writings that didn't make it into the canon, the New Testament. So let's call them non-canonical gospels or extra canonical writings, other early Christian writings. There are several of them that also mention her. And we won't go through them all, but I will give some examples of them. She's in the Gospel of Thomas. She's in her own Gospel. She's in the Dialogue of the Savior, Gospel of Philip, the Sophia of Jesus Christ. A lot of these are second century, maybe third century. So in the Gospel of Thomas, which is sort of a list of Jesus sayings, but they're sometimes the same sayings as we see in the New Testament, and sometimes different ones, even quite bizarre ones. So scholars believe that some of these go back to Jesus and others are second century development, a, a different branch of Christianity that wasn't one of the winners. Simon Peter said to Jesus, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males for every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Do I think Jesus said this? No. Um, do I think it shows us something about people's ideas of Mary Magdalene? Absolutely. It shows us that someone in the second century, some group knew when you're thinking about Jesus walking around Galilee, who do you picture with him? You picture the 12, you definitely also picture Mary Magdalene right there. And you also are aware of a little bit of tension, maybe some jealousy on the part of the male disciples. Moving on, Mary's own gospel, Gospel of Mary. Mary stood up, greeted them all and said to her brethren, do not weep and do not grieve, nor be irresolute. So this is written in this probably second century, but it's projecting back to right after Jesus has died because she's telling them not to grieve. Uh, for his grace will be entirely with you and will protect you, but rather let us praise his greatness for he has prepared us and made us into men. This is coming up again. When Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good. So she's being remembered here as a, a teacher who could move people to the good. And they began to discuss the words of the Savior. Peter said to Mary, sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of woman. Tell us the words of the Savior, which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. So here we see an idea that Jesus was closer to Mary and might give more teachings to her than he would give to the others. Uh, and Peter's not particularly a fan of that, but he does want to hear those words. Mary answered and said, what is hidden from you? I will proclaim to you. And so she shares everything she can remember that Jesus told just to her. When Mary had said this, she fell silent since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken with her. He, she told them everything. But Andrew answered and said to the brethren, say what you wish to say about what she has said, I at least do not believe that the Savior said this. Peter answered and questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman 
and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Spoiler alert, apparently yes. Then Mary wept and said to Peter, my brother Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I've thought this up myself in my heart or that I'm lying about the savior? Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot tempered. Now I see you contending against the woman like the adversaries. But if the savior made her worthy, who are you to reject her? Surely the savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. So here we have a dialogue that I'm sure never happened. But at the same time, it shows how in the second century, lots of people apparently remembered Mary as being the closest one to Jesus and connected her with teachings. And we also see hints here of some tension, maybe a parting of the ways between the, tw the 11 male disciples and Mary after the um, death of Jesus. We see remnants here of maybe some people who were kind of on Mary's side and some people who were on Peter's side. Um, Bart Ehrman has a book called Peter, Paul, and Mary, and it's about three different directions early Christianity tried to take based on the per personality of the, the person they wanted to learn about Jesus from. We know of Peter and Paul because they are canonized in the New Testament. We see evidence of tension between sort of the Jerusalem people and Paul and some differences and some smoothing over of what seems to have been pretty huge fights. But we don't get to see the tension between the third most important teaching person at the, the heart of early Jesus movement. Uh, growth, and that's Mary Magdalene. We only get to see evidence of that tension when we move into the second century in books that didn't make it. Uh, and we also have the Gospel of Philip. I love this. There were three who always walked with the Lord. Mary, his mother, and his sister. I'm not sure if this says his sister or her sister. Uh, it's confusing. And Magdalene, the one who was called his companion. His sister and his mother and his companion were each a Mary. And then it's fragmentary, so we don't have it all, but it says Mary Magdalene, he loved her more than all the other disciples and used to kiss her often on her, oh, it's missing, forehead, hand, nose, um, we don't know. The rest of the disciples said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? Does this give evidence that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married? On the absolute contrary, if this author had the idea that they were married, it would not be anything worth mentioning that the disciples thought Jesus loved her more than them because it would be his lover, would be his wife. So it would not be, it would be different. The only reason why there would be um, jealousy and tension between the dis other disciples and Mary would be if they were all just disciples and she was kind of the teacher's pet. Um, so there would be no need to mention that he kissed her often if they were lovers or married. Uh, so this is actually, it's the opposite type of evidence. It's evidence that she wasn't sexualized in the early, um, in the earliest record of her. And it, in my opinion, it's probably because she was elderly at this time um, and because her main role was intellectual and spiritual. Um, so to sum up how Mary appears in the non-canonical but still early texts, she's a dialogue partner with Jesus. She's a favorite follower of Jesus. She seems to have some teachings that the other disciples never got. Um, she's wise. She's an apostle, which means a person sent with a message. She's a leader of other apostles. Um, she's assumed by everyone, just assumed. No one even explains it. They just say, yeah, she was in the inner circle. And it seems she's not likely to be married to Jesus. Um, 
one other early, but from the eastern um, <coughs> side of things, that's early, that's a tradition about Mary, is really fun. According to Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition, during a dinner with Emperor Tiberius, Mary Magdalene was teaching about Christ's resurrection, and Caesar mocked her, saying, no more could a person rise from the dead than the egg in Mary's hand could turn red. Immediately, the egg turned red. Because of this, icons of Mary Magdalene sometimes depict her holding an egg. This is one very old explanation for why people dye Easter eggs different colors. Such a story, like many origin stories or hagiographic writings, so writings that um, make saints sound saintly, is not likely to be historical. But what does it tell us about the audience's expectations of Mary Magdalene, that she might have the audience of an emperor, and that something she might have been doing while hanging around emperors was teaching? about the resurrection. So every ancient source from all different varieties of groups that don't agree with each other, East and West, everyone early seems to have the idea of Mary as learner about the teachings and teacher of the teachings. Hmm. So then where do our popular ideas of Mary Magdalene come from? A sex worker somebody who needs to repent, um, someone hanging around naked all the time, someone with a jar, where do these come from? Here's one place. In Mark and Matthew and John, there is a story. It's very similar. It, as usual, the details are slightly different in each gospel, but basically Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. As he sat at the table, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, really expensive. Um, here's the jar. This is it. Here's our jar. Uh, but does it say Mary Magdalene? No, it says a woman. Now the gospel writers all know Mary Magdalene. They know her name and they name her. So therefore, when they're writing a story and they say a woman, it's not going to be Mary Magdalene because they would have just put her name. So this woman comes with extremely expensive ointment. She breaks the jar and pours the ointment over Jesus' head. Uh, some of the stories have it on his feet. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? This ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's performed a good service for me. You'll always have the poor with you. You can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. Little guilt trip from Jesus. So similar story in Matthew and John, never named. It's always a woman um, or, or a Mary, but Mary of Bethany. A little bit different in Luke, we see Jesus went to a Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life, Luke adds, sinful woman. It doesn't say what sin. It's the very generic Greek word for sin uh, that's used for all across the New Testament. This woman who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating there, so she came with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. The Pharisee who had invited him saw this and said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is. A oh, sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, also the guy's still named Simon, but here he's called the Pharisee and the other one he's called the leper. So Jesus is a mind reader. Simon, I heard what you, th what you thought. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. 
Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. So another bit of a guilt trip from Jesus. But here we have the jar again. And Luke knows Mary Magdalene. In fact, he names her in the very next chapter. So this is not, Luke does not mean for this to be Mary Magdalene. No one would read this and think that it was. Uh, but anyway, this story of the woman anointing Jesus with her hair that occurs in all four gospels uh, have all these differences. Mark and Matthew say they're in Bethany at Simon the leper's house. John says it's Mary of Bethany and they're at her house. Luke says she's a sinful woman. He doesn't say what the sin is. Then they're in a different town. But clearly it's been this story that's the only reason why everyone thinks, oh, Mary Magdalene, the harlot. And I blame Pope Gregory the Great. In homily 33 in the year 591, he conflicts all these women into one. And then he says that the sin was um, forbidden. And the ointment was something she used for all of her sinful acts. He says, she whom Luke calls the sinful woman, whom John calls Mary, we believe to be Mary from whom seven devils were ejected. Devils are different from demons. Demon could be an illness. It's a neutral term. Devil is evil. So he's downgraded her, uh, whatever was wrong with her were ejected. What did these seven de devils signify? If not, all the vices. So suddenly, instead of Greek, that probably means she was very sick, we've got this Pope saying, the seven deadly sins. That what was, that's what was wrong with her. She did everything wrong, like all the worst possible things wrong that she could. It's the only logical explanation because of the number seven. It is clear, brothers, that the woman previously used the unguent, the perfume, to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. So that was her dirty, bad perfume. So there you have it. Uh, a conflation of multiple women into one, including the washing of Jesus' feet with Mary Magdalene, who, as we saw from the text, was a financial patron and an intellectual kind of excellent student, and the inflation of Luke's term sinner, which has no connotation of, of prostitution in particular. Uh, it has no connotation. Uh, we can't tell what the sin is from that text. It got inflated into not only, you know, sexual sins, but every deadly sin. So, uh, but according to standard interpretive practices, by a typical biblical scholar or a literary person reading anything from antiquity or now, this perfume woman is not Mary Magdalene. And we don't know what that perfume woman's sin was, but all of this uh, Mary Magdalene, this, the sexualized harlot came from this error, whether it was on purpose um, to kind of push women down or just out of like patriarchal sort of oblivion, we don't know. But it wasn't until nine centuries later, at 1969, the Catholic Church officially declared that Mary Magdalene was not the same woman as the penitent sinner. And further, in 2016, Pope Francis actually improved upon that, saying not only was Mary Magdalene not the, this penitent sinful woman, but in fact, uh, she's on par with the apostles because she had the honor to be the first witness of the Lord's resurrection. Quote, she's the witness, the witness to the risen Christ and announces the message of the Lord's resurrection, just like the rest of the apostles. Uh, so it is right that the liturgical celebration of this woman should have the same rank of feast as that given to the celebration of the apostles in the general Roman calendar. So she gets this honor where she's placed on par with the other apostles, which is a word that means sent. Um, all of this is a great reminder of something I teach in almost all of my classes, which is we don't read things the way they are. 
we read them the way we are. It was a lot of people's expectations and gendered stereotypes that allowed these ideas of Mary Magdalene to just immediately catch on like, oh yeah, she was probably, uh, you know, slutty, young, sexy. The only reason she could have uh, been of interest to Jesus was, you know, young and sexy. Couldn't have been because she was rich or smart. No, that's not something reserved for women. So in my classes, I always teach hermeneutics, which is a fancy way of saying different lenses. And we all look through lenses, whether we admit it and know it or not. But if we learn about them and try and use them on purpose, we'll be able to see a lot more clearly. Some of the lenses that I teach in my classes are obviously a feminist lens or a gender aware lens where you're looking for how women might have been erased, for example, uh, like we did with Mary Magdalene today. Historical criticism. We also did that today, which is trying to be careful about chronology. Look at the development of all your sources, lay out the evidence you have, evaluate the evidence. Does it have any biases? Yes, gospels have a pro-Jesus bias, that's normal. Um, so what can we read behind the biases um, that's likely to be historical fact? And then there's literary criticism, class aware criticism, post-colonial criticism, queer criticism, uh, reader response, textual criticism, and many more that um, I teach my students to practice, just trying on different lenses to see what new information rises to the surface that you always skimmed over before and never noticed. Another thing I do in class is uh, thanks to my friend and colleague, Shana Scheinfeld, who wrote about this as an informal assessment practice, I do before and after word clouds. So one of my classes did this on top, you see the before word cloud, where everyone sends me five words they think of when they hear Mary Magdalene. This is before they learn about her. So they sent sex worker, Jesus wife, possessed, sinful, prostitute, penitent, disciple, wash Jesus feet, sex work, lover, married to Jesus, demons. Then we have the class about Mary Magdalene and they submit these again and we create a word cloud. Inner circle, resurrection witness, apostle, benefactor, not a prostitute, tower. Oh yes, I forgot to tell you about her name. A lot of people assume that uh, they don't really know what Magdalene means, Mary of Magdal. So they think it means a place, a place called Magdal or um, Magdala, Mary of Magdala, Mary from this place, but probably it's Magdal, the word for tower, and it's a nickname that Jesus gave her because typically throughout the New Testament, Jesus loves to give a nickname to his close followers. We just never thought of that as something that he would do for a woman because we sexualize women ourselves and don't think of the women in the New Testament as intellectuals or strong religious figures. But if we treated Mary Magdalene the same way we treat other disciples that Jesus says, I'm going to call you the rock, I'm going to call you guys, you know, the sons of thunder. Probably he said, I'm going to call Mary the tower. So try and think of her as Mary the tower um, and see how that fits. If you're interested in Mary Magdalene and would like to learn, hear more about this, CBC has a wonderful uh, podcast called Tapestry from Radio One. Uh, it's free to listen to. And they did an episode with Nicola Denzi Lewis, a scholar from Harvard. The episode is called The Truth About Mary Magdalene. And uh, you can find it if you just Google CBC Tapestry, Mary Magdalene is wonderful. And in general, if you'd like to hear more about lost or erased stories of other ancient women and other ancient constructions of masculinity and femininity, you could read my book, Gender in the Rhetoric of Jesus, which is specifically about what Jesus language, the sayings material of Jesus that historians have deemed to be probably 
um, accurate and go back in some form to Jesus, what if you analyze his authentic things? What comes out about women? Well, uh, as my book argues, quite a lot. Um, and I've also written, if you want to go back earlier in history, to the women in the Apocrypha and think about how studies of gender and women have grown and blossomed over the last 50 to 100 years. You can read free online my chapter called Women and Gender in the Apocrypha. If you just Google Sarah Parks Women and Gender in the Apocrypha or Oxford Handbook, they've provided that free to read online. Also free online is my article about the politics of citation, which is how sometimes women scholars don't get put in footnotes as much because of unconscious bias, and then they don't get read as much, and then their work doesn't get integrated into the scholarship, and we have these silos. And I call that work the Bruton phenomenon, and it appears in this volume of Gender and Second Temple Judaism, but it also appears free online in the open access journal, Bible and Critical Theory. So thanks very much for joining me uh, as we wandered through what historians say about Mary the Tower. <laughs>